Hi, I'm Dr. Deborah Devis from the Royal Institution of Australia, talking to you from Ghana land. I'm really excited to be talking to Dr. Chadden Hunter, who has worked with David Attenborough to direct Seven Worlds, One Planet, winner of the 2021 Best Film Award in our very own Cinema International Science Film Festival. Hi, Chadden, it's really lovely to have you on um, our show with us. You've had an incredible career. It's very diverse and it's come from this very science aspect to moving into arts and that combination between arts and science. So tell me how you transitioned from your PhD into film and how your science background has now shaped your career. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. I was, um, I was always passionate about nature and loved sharing my love of green things and fluffy things with as many people as I could. And I imagined myself as a biology teacher. I thought that was the best way for me to get other people excited about bugs or the jungle or whatever it was I was interested in. And so I went through science and uh, maths in school and ended up doing a PhD in biology. I was lucky enough to be studying monkeys in the mountains of Ethiopia. But I began to realize that in all of that maths and science, there was something missing about being able to share that information with a wider audience. Now, while I was up there doing my PhD studies, a film crew came to my field site and made a little film about myself and my research and my monkeys. Uh, and then the next year, National Geographic came and did a magazine article about my work. And I realized that each time I worked with those media bodies, I was getting word out to 40 million people, whereas about four people in the world <clears throat> ever read my PhD or maybe about three and a half, because I don't think my dad ever finished it. <laughs> but for me, that was a real epiphany about the power of medium, and especially uh, television as a medium, to reach more people. So I was always driven about my, my passion to share my love of nature with other people. And here, all of a sudden, landing in my lap was this incredible tool that went far beyond my academic papers. So that's what started me on this drift from academia into filmmaking. And that's really interesting as well, because I suppose a lot of people can kind of think that the only way you can make a difference is in research, but clearly the <clears throat> impact is really different. But what, why is it so important to have all of these people have access to science? Why is film such an important medium in that sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a great question. And I think, I think a lot of us uh, who love science and get deeply involved with it kind of assume that everyone else will love it and that it will just speak for itself. And I think we, we forget that the vast majority of people learn things uh, visually and uh, through storytelling type experiences. And finding ways to reach people and get science in front of people means we have to go to them and, and to basically look at how people are ingesting information. And in this modern day, people ingest information through a screen more than ever before, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or TV, and it used to be that only experts could really get information out there because you had to be peer reviewed and published, uh, that you know, journalism and newspapers were a bit slower and steadier. But in an era of digital communications and social media, when almost anyone can say anything and anyone can spread that information, the battle over truth uh, is greater than ever. And so I think it's more important than ever that science goes to that battleground, which is really on people's screens and in people's popular, uh, popular cultural feeds. That's where we have to get the word out about science and, and basically get people believing in a more empirical way to understand the world as opposed to knee jerk reactions or fanciful memes. I mean, I still like the memes, but you're, you're absolutely yeah. <laughs> right. And it's really hard to kind of battle this onslaught of disinformation and misinformation and just not really knowing where to go to look for this kind of information. Reading papers is hard and reading papers is quite boring. And so you've created this enjoyable way for people to learn and understand science. But why does that even matter? Why do people need to see science? Why do people need to learn about it? Well, I think, I think science is uh, it's a little bit misunderstood by a lot of people. and. It really is such a simple way of understanding the world. It really is when I'm talking to kids about it. It's about trial and error. It's about the way that us as a species have always tried to explore the world around us from the first moments that we were trying to work out what materials would make a fire best or work out what plants in the forest 
might make us feel better if our kids were sick or something. We've always been a species that has wanted to understand the natural world by trial and error. And the wonderful thing about science is it just moves from uh, corrected truth to corrected truth. It makes mistakes, but it doesn't have an agenda. There's no politics to it. It's not trying to brainwash people or move people in a different direction. It really is just the heart of how humans try and understand the world empirically. When I watch my toddler and I, I kind of scream at him to stop breaking things, I realize that actually what he's doing is just testing things. He's just testing to see what breaks, to see what materials do. And that's, that's very much um, human nature. So I think, I think returning to that empirical, uh, I guess, quest is what I would hope we can, we can convince more people to do. Don't just listen to someone tell you something uh, on a TV channel. You know, go out and explore the world and learn it um, in a way that, that uh, you can understand. You can kind of um, slowly do things by trial and error. So it's about, it's about questioning and I guess keeping, keeping curiosity. You know, it's curiosity that has made humans as a species so successful. Um, and so, you know, I think it kind of, it's an in, inbuilt thing that we just need to kind of reconnect with. And that's incredible as well, because that curiosity bleeds over into art that, you know, it's an expression of human nature and it's an expression of human thought. And you want to have the, that curiosity in art and you want to have the curiosity in science. And so they, they actually mount together quite well. Yeah. So how do you use your scientific curiosity and your artistic curiosity while you're filming? Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, I... Um... I still, I still love the science and I love learning about uh, the natural world and I still find animals fascinating and the things that animals do fascinating. Um, but trying to work out a slightly simplified version of that story to share with people is the challenge of filmmaking. It's, it's about making information digestible and that's what a good journalist is, um, is good at. Now we have with filmmaking some incredible tools for manipulating the senses as opposed to reading a scientific report which as you say Deborah is sometimes hard to keep awake through because you've got to concentrate on reading a scientific paper but what we have with film is the ability to uh, fill up the visual senses of a human to fill up the soundscape to even add music to add an emotional level to add words to add information and then to wrap it all up in a story and humans as a species, we love digesting things uh, with a story. We love a narrative. And politicians have learned this over the years, that it's not just about giving people facts and figures. You give them a good story. And humans, we sit around the campfire. We love to listen to a good story. And so what I find in filmmaking is there's this incredible um, like multi-sensory package that you can wrap someone up in. You can put them put them in front of a screen for a minute and get them to absorb something more, some, a, a scientific story or science through a story than we could if it was just on a paper. I think any of us who've been in, even in high school or university classrooms will know how dry a lecture can be. And then as soon as the teacher puts on a video to show you something, how many people will sit up and, and enjoy that little bit of class? Mm. And I think historically we haven't taught science by using a multimedia approach as much as we do these days. And I think what we're, what we're now um, accepting is that, is that storytelling and visuals and a multi-sensory approach is an amazing way to, to get information into the mind of a human. So it's, um, yeah, it's really exciting to be able to share science through filmmaking. And as well with that storytelling, not only is it amazing for getting people to understand a concept, but it shows the concept in context instead of just random facts that seem to be going, you know, unrelated to anything. But if you're filming wildlife and searching for that, do you go in knowing what the story is or do you have to search for it and come up with a story later? It's, it's a bit of both. It's a very interesting question. We, we do a lot of research for, for a big wildlife documentary, a big David Attenborough show. We might do six to nine months of research where all we're doing is talking to scientists we're on the phone asking them about what they see the animals doing, how often they see them doing it. If we brought a camera, how, what are our chances of seeing that behavior again? How long would we need to, say, to stay to see the animals doing it? So we do an incredible amount of homework before we actually go out to try and film these things. And we also 
try to storyboard it. We try to imagine what the shots would be and what the information would be and how we can impart that visually. Uh, I had a researcher um, recently get really excited about this incredible story about wolves. And, and I said, wow, what is it? And I said, well, these wolves have this ability to delay ovulation. And it means this and this and this. And I thought, that's a wonderful story for a magazine, but how on earth do we visualize that? So we're always doing very, being very careful about how can we visualize these big glossy um, wildlife shows. And to be fair, the big glossy ones, they, they very much are, they have to be visually uh, driven, but it takes a lot of your, you know, your science brain to digest the information. And then that slight journalistic um, hunger to try and find a way that god how would i explain this to my mate in the pub or how would i explain this to to, to granny um so yeah it's 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 a real challenge but um you know that's that's you know a, a wonderful part of the job and that is a unique skill as well not only digesting that information but then explaining it in a way that's not too complex for your mate in the pub to understand that's that's not always an easy thing to do mm. but i think that the fact that you have to go through close to nine months or more research of talking to people, that means the end product that we're getting, the end story, even if it sounds like it's only coming through one voice, it just sounds like David Edinburgh is narrating the whole thing. It's the voice of hundreds of scientists. It really is. It really is. Yeah. And even and even right to the end, you know, Dave, working with David Attenborough is amazing. He, he still is very, very sharp and he's an incredible naturalist. And even though I write the script for him, he will scrutinize every line and make sure that even if we veer off into popular popular language or the vernacular, it's not drifting away from, from what the truth is about that animal. And often, even after we get to the stage where we've edited the pictures and we've got the music and we've got the drama of the story, even at that late stage, maybe two years down the line, we all go back to the scientists and show them the rough edit and say, okay, are we getting this right? Uh, you know, it doesn't actually have to have the, sometimes the scientific terms in there, but we do not want to mis, mislead the audience about what, what the truth actually is. And that, that is an incredibly long time. So if you're looking at something like um, Seven Worlds, One Planet, your South America episode, how long did that take to film? Well, we worked on that for about three years. So we do about six months of research before we even allow ourselves out the door because we want to make sure we're getting our stories right. And then we film uh, for about two years on and off in various continents or various parts of the continent. And then we edit for about another six to nine months where we're just pulling all the images together, fine tuning our script, working with the music um, and giving it that, that final polish. And then with David at the end. So yeah, it's, a, it's an immensely long time. But then we're going out to try and capture footage that has never been seen before. And if you're gonna have that kind of bar, then the time and resources needed are immense naturally. So yeah, it's a real, it's a, mirror, a real marathon to, to make one hour of TV at the end of it. And worth it because when it's coming out as factual and as you said, film that nobody's ever seen before, that, that's a massively incredible feat. So when you were in South America, did you find that there were certain challenges associated with filming there that were different to difficulties that you had in other continents? Well, one of, the, one of the challenges with trying to make a film about South America and what unifies the wildlife there is it's such an incredibly uh, diverse continent. It, it covers about 12% of the planet, and yet it's home to more than 40% of all species on Earth. And it has scorching deserts. The Atacama Desert is the driest in the world outside of Antarctica. But the Amazon has got the Andes with incredibly high peaks. This incredible range of habitats. So to try and find themes that really told you something about South America as a package was quite a challenge. In Seven Worlds, when we did the Australia episode, it's a little bit more uh, homogenized as a kind of a dry continent. When we did Antarctica, that's quite easy because you get that it's frozen and icy. But yeah, I think the biggest challenge for South America was how we can have found a way to explain the deserts and the glaciers and the rainforests and show you that there was a, there was something unified in that continent that made those animals the way they are. So was the story when you were looking, did you think about that unification of such diversity and you sought that out or was that something that accidentally fell on your lap? Well, the diversity of South America, it was like, it was like a blessing and a curse. It was the one, episode in the series, the one continent where it was almost hard to know what to leave out. Uh, we wanted to give a sense of the color and the richness. And so we've got our beautiful macaws in there and 
we wanted to have a range of taxonomies. So we wanted to have big things like the wonderful puma hunting Patagonia. We've got penguins on the coast, um, even down to tiny poison dart frogs in the Amazon doing amazing things by carrying their tadpoles around. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a real jigsaw puzzle to try and get the right cast of characters that make it feel balanced across the taxonomy, across the habitats, and then across the themes. It's um, when you re watch these big Attenborough shows, you'll notice that there's some scenes that are dramatic. There might be predation, which is a bit upsetting. There's some scenes that might be a little bit more comedic, like courtship amongst birds, or there might be some that are a bit more heartwarming, like parental stories. And so for us, we're taking you, the viewer, on a very emotional roller coaster ride. That's the idea. We're trying to hook you in and take you on a really emotional, gut wrenching ride. But we've got to make sure there's a balanced journey so you get to the end. It's like getting to the end of a chocolate box and feeling like it's been a very satisfying experience. <laughs> So, and it usually is with a chocolate box. Uh, you're not wrong. You're not <clears> wrong. Um, that satisfaction is something that you've taken three years of being in this incredibly vibrant place, talking to these people who know about all sorts of animals that you know a lot of us have never heard of, and then putting it down, condensing it down into this kind of one-hour feature. Over that whole time that you were in South America and getting ready for it. Was there one particular moment that stood out to you as incredible, regardless of whether it made it onto film or not? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of just the just the sheer experience of it, when we were we were filming uh, around Angel Falls, the the world's tallest waterfall up in Venezuela, it was incredibly hard to get access to, and we had to go and camp there for a few weeks to film those waterfalls. We had to use a helicopter, and it was very very dangerous flying conditions because we wanted it to be at the end of the wet season when the waterfall still had a lot of water pouring off but it meant that clouds could form really quickly and the helicopter uh, can't fly through clouds it has to has a visual of where to land but we're flying along one one day and the, the captain started yelling in spanish about the cave the cave and my spanish isn't that great and i was like what's he talking about and I realized he was starting, he was flying us into this gigantic cave. It was like something out of science fiction. And this helicopter, we, as a helicopter, we just flew into this cave. And he said he was needed to wash the helicopter. And it's like, oh, this is not going to end well. And we basically land, he flew into this cave in which a waterfall was pouring in and then landed the helicopter at the bottom of a waterfall and got out casually and just started kind of rubbing his helicopter down in this waterfall. And we were just like, like shaking, like, I can't, I can't believe you could do that with a helicopter. That's incredible. I think it sounds like you um, need a very strong sense of adventure to be able to do this. <laughs> so what yeah. advice would you have for young people to engage in science and film or to pursue this in the future? And how, how has that science background informed all of that future filmmaking? Yeah, I mean, science for me has been a wonderful journey. As I said, for anybody who's got a curiosity about the world and wants to learn how it works, um, it's, it's a wonderful career. You know, you'll always find fascinating things to learn in it. And it leads to so many other careers. I mean, as I said, I started off science thinking I'd be uh, a science teacher. I've ended up in, in filmmaking. And I think it helps me a lot because I, I have a, uh, that I've kept that questioning instinct and, you know, something about the, the scientific process is not taking things at, at face level, is to ask, ask that deeper question, maybe ask for a second source of information to kind of keep that curiosity up uh, and, to, and to just kind of dig a little deeper. And I think those skills are invaluable no matter what we end up doing. Um, the kind of the, the analytical mind is a really, really fun experience. And I think, you know, you can take that science learning and that that analytical adventure, you know, that kind of investigative spirit into so many other careers. So yeah, I think science is, is, is a glorious career. And it's such a, it's such a key point as well, because it's easy to think of science as just a bunch of fun facts or not fun facts in some people's opinions, but it's not, it's about that analytical thought. It's about that curiosity and that can, that can take you into a helicopter that almost flies through a waterfall, like scary stuff. So thank you so much for talking to me today, Chatton. That was absolutely fascinating and good luck with all your future endeavors. Lovely. Thanks, Deborah. Lovely chatting to you.